Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, you are listening to the most electrifying podcast in all of internet radio today. You are listening to The Sports Wire. My name is Vinny Apicella, broadcasting to you live from historic New Britain, Connecticut. Still under lockdown, still under quarantine. No, literally practicing social distancing or physical distancing or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and I have a great interview for you today. I can't express how excited I am. Guy Evans, the author of <clears throat> of Nitro, the incredible rise and inevitable collapse of Ted Turner's WCW, will be on the line with me today doing a great interview. We've been planning it since, gosh, I think November of last year, and it just hadn't worked out. So, therefore, seeing as everybody is under this social isolation stay-at-home order, uh, we figured we might as well do it today. I got in touch with him, and uh, he said that he was free this morning, so that's what we're going to do. Can't wait to talk to him about the book, but also to kind of get into his, you know, his backstory, how he be- became a wrestling fan, how long ago he became a wrestling fan, what made him write about WCW, uh, you know, will we see any books in the future, like maybe one of ECW and delving diving deep into ECW, although <laughs> uh, diving deep into ECW mean talking at length with Paul Heyman, and well, Paul Heyman is not always the most credible source, as <laughs> as has been evidenced in many documentaries, but I digress. I would love to see more books come out from him, because he comes at it unbiased, whereas The Death of WCW, which was written by, I believe, Brian Alvarez, uh, very, very slanted against WCW, very slanted against, actually, very slanted against major wrestling in general, with the exception of AEW, because all those dirt sheet writers are AEW fanboys. (laughs) But I do enjoy uh, this book, Nitro, because it was fantastic, and I've been singing its praises since I read it. Having over 120 interviews with key people from both WCW and Turner Broadcasting, he put his work into it. He did his research, he, you know, talked with the key people, he talked to Eric Bischoff, he talked to Brad Siegel, he talked to uh, Dick Cheatham, who was in charge of the finances, Kevin Nash, Diamond Dallas Page. The book is awesome, and I highly recommend it. it. I bought it on Amazon. I bought it on, you know, Amazon got it delivered, and it was absolutely fantastic. So I definitely recommend you going out and buying it because it's just an awesome, awesome book. So... After the break, I will be back. I will be back with Guy Evans on the line talking about Nitro, the incredible rise and inevitable collapse of Ted Turner's WCW with the author Guy Evans. I'll be back, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, Vinny. All right. How you doing, guy? Sorry about that. How's everything? No, not a problem at all. Everything is going well. Awesome. Uh, thank you for agreeing to. Oh, you're breaking up a little bit. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. You broke up a little bit. You can hear me okay? I can hear you very well, yes. No, I appreciate you uh, asking me on. I'm happy to do it. Well, that's great. I have to say that I uh, I absolutely loved oh, your book. Uh, Nitro was, 
it was fantastic, which is why I've been singing its praises ever since yeah, I yeah, read no, it. I appreciate that. It was a, a lot of work that went into it, so uh makes it worthwhile when I hear stuff like that, you know? Yeah, no, and, and I appreciate you uh, diving deep into it with a with an unbiased look at it, because there are other books out there uh, that were biased towards a lot of things, and you couldn't get the real story, but Nitro is the most in-depth story and the most unbiased story of WCW from start well, to finish. I appreciate that. I think you have to be uh, unbiased, you know, when you're, when you're analyzing a business that you personally didn't work in, you know, I mean, I, I as I right. said uh, before, you know, I never had any prior contacts in the wrestling business, never worked in the business. So for me to come in and say, well, here's what I think went well. And here's what I think didn't go so well. I mean, there's not much relevance there to, to what I'm saying. And I don't think that that would be particularly interesting to read. So I think there was no other way to do it really, but let the people involved tell the story. You know what I mean? I agree. Um, but before we get to the book, let's, uh, let's kind of start with your, your history. Uh, how long have you been a wrestling fan? Okay. So we're, we're up and running Vinny, <laughs> just so I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. We are. All right, good to know. Um, well, um, I suppose, you know, like many other people, uh, you know, I was made a fan through the, the, the wrestling boom in the mid to late 90s. Um, obviously, as you can probably tell in listening to my voice, uh, I grew up in the, in the UK. Um, but even in the UK, um, wrestling was a huge thing during that time and very much a, a mainstream phenomenon um, during the, the late 90s especially. And uh, that's when really I was introduced to, to uh, professional wrestling and followed actually both WCW and the WWF very closely at that time. Um, but again, like many other people, once WCW went away, that was really the, the extent of my interest in wrestling. You know, I just kind of uh, moved on to some other things and instinctively knew that it probably wasn't going to be quite as entertaining as it was in the past. Right. And uh, it wasn't until years later... Uh, almost a decade later, actually, that I started really revisiting some of those times and really thinking about WCW again and looking at some of the documentaries and books and accounts of the story that had been put out there. And I suppose I had a lot of questions as a fan who followed it so closely back then that I didn't particularly feel had been adequately answered, at least from my perspective. And I, I thought, you know what, there's a lot of good stuff that's already been done on this subject, but I think there's probably... Quite a bit more to be uncovered and so that's what really got me started on uh, on this journey and we're all thankful that you did that <laughs> well, uh, but um so you stopped wrestling after the monday night war and it, what you did you weren't one of the people that was particularly a fan of both wcw and wwf or uh why didn't you transition to stay watching to the WWF uh, at the time? Did you watch any of the invasion angle or any of the bigger name WCW wrestlers going over to uh, WWF? I did. Yeah. I think in fairness, I probably stuck around for about a year or so. Um, okay. You know, I remember the NWO in invasion or, or short lived, you know, storyline in right. 2002. That was probably around there was probably when I sort of checked out for a while. Um, okay. I think I think in retrospect, um, you know, again, uh, I wasn't alone in this feeling. Obviously, I think there was an awareness that without that competitive um, situation between the two companies, um, right. you know, I, I felt that um, the programming wasn't going to be as compelling as it as it had been in the past. And I think, you know, up until very recently. Uh, you know, when, when AEW has come into the mix and at least shook things up to some extent, although I think certainly nowhere near um, the level of competition that we saw in the time period that we're talking about. Uh, but up mm -hmm. until very recently, you know, wrestling fans have obviously bemoaned the fact that you've gone uh, more or less two decades without any real competition for, uh, for the WWE and WWF. So I think, you know, just having that awareness that uh, the weekly competition was no longer happening um, you know, I, I, I sort of felt like it, it probably wasn't going to be the same as before. And so that's kind of why I checked out. Okay. And I, and I understand that because I mean, I've, I've watched wrestling, you know, throughout the entire time, but there was a time, you know, where it wasn't as big of a priority. Like I always kept yeah. up with it, but I wasn't 
glued to the TV every Monday night like I was during the Monday Night War. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I literally had two TVs in my bedroom where I had Nitro and Raw side by side and just changed the volume when I saw something okay. good. But yeah, you're right. Um, without competition, there was nobody chasing exactly. uh, WWE. So they didn't have to worry about doing better writing angles and, and then going to the PG era. Mm-hmm. Uh, I completely agree with you. And I think by the ratings now, uh, a lot of people felt the same way. During yeah, definitely. The... And, and, I, and I think in terms of just the, uh, the, the relevancy of wrestling on a, on a mainstream level and what it means culturally, I mean, it's, it's more or less night and day, I think, when you compare what it was like back then to what it is now. And, and obviously there are external factors that have influenced that as well. I don't think it's entirely everything to do with what's happened in the wrestling business. I mean, certainly... Uh, the culture itself has changed, media has changed, mm-hmm. the way people consume content has changed, um, so that there are many things that go into it. Um, but I think uh, a lot of wrestling fans, again, especially perhaps people like myself who were made a fan uh, during that time or perhaps shortly before that time or after that time, you know, have a certain wistfulness of, of when you know, things were really, uh, really hot and, and wrestling was really a part of, of mainstream pop culture. And I, I'm not so sure that you're ever going to see a situation like that again, at least not in the near future, unfortunately. And I, I have a feeling you're right, especially with back then you had guys like Goldberg, Hogan, Austin, Rock, the guys that transcended the business. Um, exactly. Nowadays, you don't have that. John Cena's on his decline. Undertaker's on his decline. Although Undertaker was never one of those guys that transcended the business. Uh, you know, Roman Reigns is, is not, uh, again, not at the level that we saw guys rise up. Like, you don't see TV Guide covers wrestlers anymore. You don't see guys making the, tra- the transition uh, that you can go. Well, that's what so-and-so does. Because they still go back to Hogan, Goldberg, Austin, DDP. Uh, you know, the guys that had transcended the business. And I... I feel like you're right there there isn't that mainstream appeal anymore well i've heard the phrase used before which i think is a particularly instructive phrase you know you need people who can appeal to the entire couch so if you imagine that your family sitting down to watch a show uh, and you think about some of those names that you mentioned and throw in you know the rick flares of the world and the hulk hogan's of the world and so on you know there was something about these these people these these characters that resonated you know, with a young fan, with a teenage fan, with someone who's a, has a young adult, someone who's a parent, maybe a, a, a grandparent, um, to varying degrees, certainly, and at different times, probably more so to certain people um, in terms of, in terms of their, their demographics. But um, again, I, I think, unfortunately, today, and this, this is where I'm going to inject some of my personal opinion, because as you know, I try not to do that, um, you know, in, in the book. Um, you know, I think you have a lot of people who resonate very strongly with the wrestling audience, um, but unfortunately, to use your word, you know, fail to sort of transcend beyond those borders and appeal to people who aren't wrestling fans. And, and one of the things I know um, many people in the business are concerned with, and I share this concern as someone who wants to see wrestling do well, is, you know, how, how easy it is nowadays to create new fans. You know, I think we can all, we can all see that there's a um, fairly significant um, section of fans who are extremely loyal um, and will follow their favorite wrestlers and follow their favorite companies and, and keep watching um, over a long period of time. Um, you know, I think there's a, a subset of fans that has been created um, in the last few years who, who follow it very fervently and passionately. Um, but I, I do think that wrestling perhaps isn't as accessible um as as it once was in the past and what i mean by that is um i'm not sure that the business presents the same array of characters that can be easily identified with by again think about it in in whatever terms you want the entire couch the entire family the man on the street however you want to define it um i think to really understand and appreciate and follow wrestling nowadays it's much more important uh, to, to really embed yourself within the wrestling culture. Otherwise, you find yourself at times watching the shows and not quite knowing exactly what's going on. So I think uh, that's, that's probably a problem that a lot of companies need to tackle. 
And I think you're right because a lot of times, I mean, I've heard it used on, you know, different podcasts that a lot, a lot of the wrestlers now are are interchangeable, mm. where you could just plug anybody into any storyline and it'll work. Whereas back during the you know mid nine mid to late nineties, you couldn't have a guy like, uh, let's say Duke the Dumpster Drosy be that Steve Austin character. Right. Right. You couldn't you couldn't have, you know, you couldn't interchange people out because they had their own personalities. They had their own gimmick storylines and it was special to that person. Mm. And I agree with you. Uh, there needs to be some kind of difference in the top guys because for them to like even with, uh, you know, this past WrestleMania, which on its which honestly was a unique experience because of everything we we're going through. Mm. But to just take Roman out, Roman Reigns out of the main event and put Braun Strowman in there without any buildup and just have that, you know, generic match with Goldberg. It, you know, it just showed that there is no differentiation anymore. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, as wrestling fans, a lot of times we have a, um, a, a hyper focus on the creative aspect of wrestling. And, you know, we sort of think, well, if someone was to come in and, and really deliver some, some cutting edge storylines and start doing some more interesting things from a creative standpoint, maybe that would kick everything back into high gear. But I think the, the reality is, and I think again, you come to this conclusion when you, you look back upon the time period we're talking about today and what the book focuses on is that wrestling, like many other forms of entertainment really is a personality driven star driven business. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, is, is the most important factor at play. Now, when you're able to combine someone on the level of a Steve Austin or a Rock and, and, and uh, give them material which is, is up to par with, with their personality and really bring out their best character traits, I think that's when um, you're really onto a winning formula. Um, but I don't think you can attach you know, supposedly brilliant um, creative ideas to someone who's not on that level um, or someone, again, to revisit what we've just been talking about someone who doesn't resonate fully with the mainstream audience. So um, the, the bright side to that, I suppose, is, you know, it only takes, you know, one uh, individual to come along and, you know, no one necessarily knows when that could be, but it only takes one person to come along who presents something uh, that we haven't seen before and really um, uh, develops a, a personality and a, and a personal brand that, um, that can, you uh, sort of take take wrestling to that mainstream level again and things could change you know it, it, it only takes one person to uh to do that so i think that's what we're all waiting on is who is going to be that next you know hulk hogan rick flair stone cold the rock etc cetera, etc cetera. um and so i suppose that's that's kind of the positive thing out of all of this you're absolutely right well let's transition into uh nitro and um you know the the book mm -hmm. and um I got to say, you did, you, you really put in your work, you put in your research, you did over 120 interviews mm -hmm. with former WCW and Turner Broadcasting personnel. Uh, what made you decide, I mean, I know you touched on it briefly, mm -hmm. um, but what, what drove you to, um, or, or should I say, how did you start with the connections mm. to get those 120 uh, interviews, as you said yourself, you didn't have any connections in the professional wrestling world. Yeah, I, honestly, um, it w I've, I've called it before kind of a domino effect. I think it was a situation where uh, the more people that I spoke to, the more people I was introduced to, the more angles I was introduced to, so to speak, that I hadn't previously considered in terms of some of the content and, and what I could be writing about. Um, so I think I started really from a very honest place, which was you know, I felt that this was a fascinating time period, a fascinating subject. You've got a wrestling company that's owned by this, this corporate behemoth, and many of the executives within this corporation obviously have a, an open disdain for this particular product. At the same time, it's their highest rated form of programming, so that's, that's very interesting. If you think about some of the personalities at play, you know, Ted Turner alone is a fascinating case study, and we haven't even got into the wrestling side when it comes to, to personalities. Um, you think about some of the elements to the story, as I touched on earlier, that um, hadn't fully been explained, I think, in the past. You know, we'd heard about all of these 
shadowy figures, whether they be, you know, Jamie Kellner or Harvey Schiller or Stu Snyder, Brad Siegel, people of, of that ilk that as fans we had kind of heard about before but never really heard their, their side of the story. And so I, I started from, uh, again, quite an honest place, which is, you know, hey, I'd like to find out um, some answers to these questions and I'd like to sort of fill some of the gaps here. And I'm just going to talk to as many people as I can and kind of see where this goes. And I think it, it wasn't until about six months in that I fully came to grips with, you know, okay, I, I understand exactly um, what this story is all about now. I understand that, that you know, a, a primary driver in this story is going to be exploring the relationship between Turner Broadcasting um, and, and WCW. And that's, that's really going to be my starting point in terms of focusing on this era. So it, it wasn't as if, uh, you know, I kind of sat down and had this, this master plan from day one. Here's exactly how I'm going to do it. Here's exactly who I'm going to talk to. Um, I really started with a totally blank canvas, tried to, you know, have no sort of preconceptions or, or conclusions in mind before I started. And I really just let the people who were there and also the, the evidence um, sort of dictate the direction that I went in. And, and what, I, what I mean by that is I was very fortunate to have access to a lot of company materials which have really just been under lock and key for about the best part of two decades. Um, talking about things like financial statements and memos and, and, and internal company documents. And I was really able to, to utilize those things and kind of cross-reference with what I was getting from the interviews and, and use all of that um, in concert to shape, shape the direction that I went down. So that was really the approach that I took. It was something that evolved, I think, pretty naturally over time. Great. And uh, so that, that's, that's great. And it great, greatly describes your, uh, your mindset into going into it. And I like that you approached it without any preconceived notions. And, and I got to say, even I, and you know, a lot of people, we learned a lot from the book. Like I didn't know about all the shadowy figures. I, I knew some of it mm -hmm. just from listening to podcasts or even watching some documentaries, but uh, I didn't know all of it. And, and it really went into, uh, um, you know, went into it and you can tell the, the research that you put behind it. Uh, who was your first contact that you reached out to that you that you were able to uh, agree, agree to do an interview with you for the book? Yeah, this is funny because this is probably a name I think some people listening will, will be familiar with, others not so much. Uh, there was a guy by the name of Rob Garner who was one of the VPs with WCW back in the day who, for mm -hmm. whatever reason, was the first person that I spoke to. And I, I don't necessarily know if there was any rhyme or reason to that. I think that was just more of a matter of scheduling. You know, it just, mm -hmm. just so happened that he was the first person um, that I could get on the schedule. And, uh, you know, I, I remember doing that initial conversation with him. This was in January of 2015. So the, mm -hmm. book, the, book, wow. the book came out in July of 2018. And so mm -hmm. you know, there's a three and a half year lapse there between the first interview and publication. And, uh, you know, I, I remember just learning a lot and gaining a lot of insight from that interview. Um, and, and that really inspiring me with confidence that there's something to this. There's, there's obviously some kind of a, a yearning or a desire uh, for people to want this story to be told um, in hopefully as objective a manner as possible. You know, you, you have to obviously qualify that with an understanding that, that everyone, uh, you know, subliminally or subconsciously has some kind of um, preconceptions or, or notions about anything. It's impossible to mm. completely separate yourself from that. But I think you try to consciously remind yourself that, hey, this is something where I'm going to let the, the data, the evidence, uh, the facts, the figures, the people who are involved, you know, drive this story and try to lay out as many different perspectives as I can to the reader and then, you know, basically put them in a position where they can make up their own mind about things. And so I, rem I remember talking to Rob and I remember he was so enthusiastic that, um, that I was doing this, this book and he said, you know, I, I've really not done any interviews um, on this subject since WCW closed down, but he said, you know, I think it's, it's time now. I think I'm ready to open up and talk about this. And I think he was frustrated with um, as we discussed some of the, the documentaries and some of the coverage of the story that had come out. Um, and so that was another factor that really helped me, I think, in putting together this book was, was the timing factor. 
I think that this came along, I think, at, at a time where people were willing to open up maybe more than they had in the past. And so I'm not so sure a book like this could have been produced in, say, you know, 2005, 2008, pick a year. I think, quite honestly, it had to be this amount of time that's gone by for people to really, uh, really open up. Absolutely. Um, did you have to kind of prove yourself? Did you have to mm -hmm. prove to a lot of the, especially the talent, guys like Kevin Nash, DDP, Eric Bischoff, uh, did you have to prove that you weren't, you know, just a fanboy trying to get an interview, but that this was a legitimate attempt at getting the story out there? I, I would like to think, Vinny, that that sort of uh, became evident in the first few minutes of, of the interviews that I conducted. I think most people mm -hmm. got a sense that, you know, this is a legitimate project, that, that I'm coming from it from the standpoint of, curiosity really just wanting to find out exactly what happened and, and wanting tr to try to involve as many different voices as I can and you know I've, I've said this in some other interviews I think the number one tool in your toolbox when you're doing something like this is to you know ask ask open-ended questions and uh, and really make sure that you're listening to the answers I mean it's it's such a basic approach um, but I'm not you know gonna pick up the phone and start giving um, a talent, my opinion on on uh, on WCW storylines, you know. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, my my approach was, you know, I'm going to ask very open ended questions that relate to their tenure with the company. I'm going to listen. I'm going to take notes. I'm going to see what direction they go down, and then I'm going to use that to drive the rest of the interview. So, I wasn't too concerned with that because I knew that that would um, come out during the course of the interview. But to be totally honest with you, Vinny, my mindset was, you know, this book is going to get written no matter what. So mm -hmm. if, if, you know, if, if a particular person has been contacted and they decide they don't want to do an interview, mm -hmm. that's their prerogative. They can't say years down the line that they weren't contacted. Right. Uh, right. So it's, you know, it, it's going to get completed no matter what, if they want to have their say and they want to give their input, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly thankful and, and grateful for that. Um, if they decide not to, then that's not something that I can control, and that's not something that's going to stop the ultimate production of the book. So that's really where I came from with that. Okay. Were there were there anybody that actually declined to, to interview? Very few people, to be honest. I mean, there were more people, I would say, on the corporate side okay. um, that were hesitant to, to talk about certain things. Um, you know, there's people who were fairly high up, I think, in the Turner food chain who are still active in the, the entertainment business, for example, that weren't really thrilled about um, discussing, you know, certain elements of the story. Um, mm -hmm. but, but surprisingly, um, you know, most people that I was able to get in contact with, I think, were pretty happy about doing it. And I think <clears throat> one of the things, again, that really helped was I talked about that domino effect before. Uh, right. What I learned, you know, throughout doing this project was um, even though it's been all of these years later, uh, the people who worked at WCW, especially on the production side, for example, you know, these people are still um, effectively almost family-like in the way that they interact with each other, communicate with each other. You know, there's still, there's still a community of people um, out there who, who worked at WCW. I mean, you think about all of the time they spent together on the road, all of the time they spent together in a business where there's no off season, you know, and they were traveling from city to city. I mean, these are connections that didn't disappear once the company went out of business. Right. And so, you know, what I'm get what, what I'm getting at is, I was conscious of the fact that once I started talking to people and, and went down this this road, the word was going to travel fairly quickly that there was there was something going on, and so that 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 really helped me because I think, again, the, the word travel, that this was a legitimate positive project. And yeah. And, and I, and I do see that and I can understand that. And I can understand why some live in the corporate structure of, you know, be it TBS or any other, uh, any other media company might not be interested. Uh, and, and you touched on something that I, that I like that you said a lot of the production crew and, uh, the people that worked behind the scenes were more like a family in that. Um, so, because I did hear that when you did have a podcast with Neil Pruitt, uh, Secrets of WCW mm -hmm. Nitro, uh, which was great, by the way. I listened to every episode that had come out, and 
if any new ones come out, I'll be the first one to listen. Uh, I heard that through there because he talked with such lovingly terms with the people that he worked behind the mm. scenes with. Uh, yes. And so tell me how that, um, just taking a sidebar, how did that uh, podcast come about? Well, that's an interesting story and I appreciate you listening and we are looking to try to record some new shows fairly soon so you can check out for that. Um, well, that, that came about from uh, my initial conversations with Neil from okay. the book. Um, what's interesting is the first time that I spoke to Neil, I called him up, as I did with a lot of people, just out of the blue. And obviously, you know, when someone's picking up the phone and they've never heard of you before and, um, you know, you, you've probably got about 10 seconds, 15 seconds to sell right. yourself and help them understand, you know, why they should not hang up the phone, basically. Mm-hmm. And uh, what was funny about Neil is I remember almost immediately he was sort of, you know, it, he indicated he wasn't particularly interested in, in doing an interview. <laughs> wow. And I kind of, and this, this, this was probably late 2015. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I said to him, you know what, if, if it's okay with you, I'd like to send you an email with a little bit more detail about the project, give you some time to look it over, um, and then hopefully we can get on the phone mm-hmm. and talk about it more. And uh, luckily, he agreed to do it, and we ended up doing an interview for about two hours and covered just just so much. And <clears throat> what was interesting, Vinny, is a couple of weeks later, I got a, a message in my inbox, and it was a uh, a file that Neil had recorded on his way way home from okay. work one day, and he and he said, "Guy, you know." I, I know we covered a lot of ground during the interview, but I, th- I think there's a, a couple of stories here that would be interesting for your book. And I'd like to, you know, while I'm on the road here, I'd like to, to record them and send them to you. And as I'm listening to this, I said, you know, first of all, I really appreciate the guy doing right. this, but also, you know, I think, I think wrestling fans need to hear some of this stuff. I mean, he's talking about working with Roddy Piper and Ric Flair and Steve Austin and some real, you know, beh- behind the scenes stories and nuggets that, only someone like him in that position would know. Right. And, uh, you know, and that kind of got the wheels turning that maybe we should uh, look to do a podcast. So, again, it was something that kind of uh, came together pretty unexpectedly. But I think it's been a, a really good thing for, uh, for the fans to hear some of those stories. Oh, absolutely. And his voice actually uh, lives in infamy as being the voice of the NWO, uh, right. you know, with... Uh, you know, the following announcement has been paid for by the New World Order, and it's still used to this day on WWE programming when they need to talk about the NWO. That's that's right. And, you know, he was the, the voice of the NWO. He obviously produced uh, a lot of those segments. And if you, you read the book, you'll really learn about his role in defining the look and feel of, of a lot of those segments, including the, the black and yep. white, um, you know, which, which everyone, you know, talks about and remembers so fondly. So, you know, he w- he was very instrumental in, in a lot of that stuff. And as a result, he's he's held in pretty high regard by a lot of those uh, people today. So he's a fascinating guy. He's an extremely creative, very smart guy. And as you said there, Vinny, if you haven't, people out there haven't listened to it, if you just type in Neil Pruitt, which is N-E-A-L-P-R-U-I-T-C, and search for the podcast, I think we have about 40 or 45 uh, episodes for people to listen to yeah and i highly recommend it too especially for people who who are out there who uh want to hear about the backstage uh doings of wcw um you know working with roddy piper out in uh, alcatraz or uh that was probably one of my favorite stories um but just and and hearing how he his career evolved working for deep south wrestling and working with guys that are up on the WWE roster now, like The Miz. Um, mm-hmm. Absolutely fantastic. Highly recommended. Um, but let's get back to Nitro now. And uh, who would you say was probably, your, as a fan, your most interesting interview that you learned the most of, the most from? So, again, I'm going to throw a name at you, which, uh, you know, I, w- I wish I had a more – uh, <laughs> interesting answer to this one, but there's a guy, uh, he was the former president of TBS. His name is Bill Burke. Mm-hmm. And I had the opportunity to go and speak with him in person. And, and that's something else I should mention as well. A lot of uh, 
interviews, fortunately, I was able to do sitting across from people, which was good. Yeah. And I went to his office and spent about two and a half hours sitting down with him. And Biddy, the, the stuff that I learned about Ted Turner, Turner Broadcasting, uh, the television industry in the late 90s and how it functioned, advertising, um, WCW's place within all of that, the stuff that I learned in that conversation was really invaluable. You know, and I, and I left that room, I remember going home thinking, I mean, if I, if I was confident that the book was um, hopefully going to be interesting before, this has just taken it to an entirely new right. level. And, and, and not only that, you know, when you speak to someone who's ran a television network, for example, you learn all, all kinds of things that you didn't know going in uh, that actually you can use not only with respect to the particular project you're working on, but a lot of times in, in other facets and areas of your life as well. So in terms of time well spent and in terms of uh, a positive memory that came out of all of this, you know, that meeting that I had with Bill Burke, um, you know, again, I could probably have talked to him for 20 hours on the phone, but nothing could really replace those couple of hours sitting down face to face and the insights that I got from that. So that, that was really, really tremendous. Man, I, I envy you for being able to talk to all these people and, you know, it's, it's uh, it obviously went into your, your work and the passion behind it. Um, I, I truly applaud you for that. Uh, well, I appreciate that. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so how was it, how hard was it lining up all these interviews? I mean, it's a painstaking process. As you said, it was a three and a half year journey from the first interview to publication. How hard was it setting up all these interviews? It was very difficult. Um, you know, I, there were certain people, and I, I don't mean to dramatize it more than I have to, but there were some interviews that actually were an 18 month process mm -hmm. in terms of getting someone, you know, from the point of making initial contact to getting someone to actually agree to be interviewed. Right. And it, it wasn't as if I was, you know, calling them every single day, pestering them around the clock. I mean, you check in sporadically and, uh, and, and you know, touch base with people and, and, and see if everything's still on track. You know, there were some people who were available fairly immediately. But as I say, there were some of the more higher profile names. There was a lot of work that went into that. Because, again, you have to think about it from their perspective. What incentive did they necessarily have? Uh, to to take this interview, right? right? I mean, it, it's not immediately clear what they were gaining from it other than helping this this project. Some people had been burned in the past with granting interviews and all of a sudden, you know, the end product doesn't quite resemble what it is that they actually mm -hmm. said. Um, and so you have to kind of go in with, with kid gloves with some people with that knowledge in mind in terms of how you uh, present what you're doing and how you explain it to people. So... You know, I wish there was like a website or a database I could just log on to that says, "Here, are, here's a complete list of Turner and WCW employees. Click here to, you know, email all of them." That would have been <laughs> right. Uh, but, but unfortunately, it was uh, for every single person. There was quite a lot of work that went into it. And uh, it was, you know, and I, and I can imagine it being a painstaking process. Absolutely, um, especially some of the people that are still active in. You know, I mean, for the most part, everybody that you interviewed is still active in some aspect of entertainment, be it wrestling or, or television. Uh, and I can imagine going around their schedules and trying to get things done. Um, and, and just reading the, w, the, the, the book about, you know, with all the legal stuff that you were able to get into, the, and, and like you mentioned, all the, you know, the, the, the legal workings, the legal p documents and the memos and everything, and you put them in here, you know, word for word as, uh, you know, just to give readers the insight into what actually was going on uh, behind the scenes and not necessarily, you know, and, and yeah, behind the scenes of the company. That's right. And, and what was amazing, Vinny, is, you know, sometimes you would interview people and have, for whatever reason, a certain connection or rapport with them. And some people would say, you know what, I've, I've really got a good feeling about this. I feel that you're approaching this in a, in a good way. Let me let me go into the attic or go into my, my basement. I think I've got some, some files and documents laying around um, from my time at WCW. Let, let me see what I can come up with. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was amazed by that, you know, because I, again, 
going into this with a to totally blank slate, blank canvas, had no conception that that could even be an end result. So some of the some of the best things that you see on that note in the book, right. um, a lot of that di you know did come obviously from from my own digging, but some of that came from some very helpful and uh, and and very kind people who were just just willing to to contribute to the book. So I'm I'm very again very grateful for that. You know, I got to say, um, one of the names um, I learned about, like I never heard of this person, I never heard of a possible uh, a coup with this person taking over at one point, Lenita Erickson, um, you know, trying to capitalize. And, you know, I, I, I really love the, the story that, that you tell about her and her involvement in WCW, how, you know, she was hired on and immediately JJ got a hold of her and, and that they, they were looking to have a coup of taking over WCW. Sorry, yeah, you, you cut out a little bit there, Vinny, but I think I got the question. Uh, Lenita Erickson, that's, uh, that's a name that, that has come up a lot um, in, in doing some of these interviews. And, and as you mentioned, she really plays a very important role uh, on, on the back end of, of the book in terms of influencing ultimately what happened with the right. And, um, you know, again, th that was simply a case of, you know, I, I knew who she was going into the mm -hmm. process, and I knew that this was someone that I needed to talk to um, and had heard her name come up in, in some conversations, but certainly didn't know the extent of her involvement and ultimately how important it, it ended right. up being. And uh, that really developed over the course of several conversations with her and her saying, you know, I, I, again, similar to what I talked about earlier, her saying, I, you know, I think it's it's time for me to to open up about some things and kind of tell my side of the right. story. And so uh, it's been really fascinating to see people's reactions. To yeah. That. My, my jaw dropped when I read about that. Cause I, that was something that was never ever brought to light that I had ever heard of. Um, mm -hmm. So um, the success of the book by Eric Bischoff on eight weeks, and he's been, you know, he's the one that said, you know, this is probably the most comprehensive in-depth and truthful document of you know documentary book about wcw so to receive high praise for like that from the guy who used to run the is impressive uh so i want to just congratulate you for that because the book uh was absolutely fantastic uh well well i uh i should say on that one video I, again i do appreciate your kind words and i think with respect to Eric Bischoff specifically, you know, the, the word that I've used in describing my sort of perception of what he said, you know, I think it's wh whatever people think about him, uh, and obviously fans have, have sometimes very strong <laughs> yep. opinions about him, you know, I think it's, it's rather commendable if you think about it that this is a book that, um, as he has said, I think, you know, presents some content which... Uh, at times, um, is not too flattering to read right. about himself, and in, in, you know includes some stuff in there that I'm sure he'd rather not read about. And uh, not everyone who was asked about Eric Bischoff had the the nicest things to say. Um, and but but to be able to separate that from his wider analysis mm -hmm. of the book, to be able to say, well, yeah, there's some stuff in here that I really you know didn't enjoy reading, but you know I'm not going to let that take away from my overall impressions of the project. Um, I think, again, that's, that's pretty commendable because most of us in the same situation, if we were reading a book about a company that we worked for and there were a lot of stories and anecdotes and, and factual information that, that really didn't look, make us look so great, um, I think the natural human tendency is to say, well, it's a bunch of BS, it's a bunch of lies, it's propaganda, it's, it's someone uh, with an axe to grind. And so, again, I think it's, it's, it's very commendable and um, I have a lot of respect for the the very kind things that, that he said about the book, you know, both to me personally and to uh, to his listeners as well. So that's absolutely that's really amazing. Um, do you have any other uh, books coming down the line that uh, you're that you're in the middle of writing now, or something that you could tell us without, you know, crossing any uh, you know any boundaries or whatever? No, absolutely. I think. Um, what I would ask people to do is if, if you want to follow the Twitter account, uh, WCW mm -hmm. Nitro book, 
Um, that's probably the best place to get updates on, on future books because I can tell you that I would like to think within about uh, six months mm -hmm. or so, you know, I'll be able to, to make uh, an announcement. So the short answer is yes, uh, there's definitely something in the works. It's just a matter of uh, when everything is going to be completed because uh, unfortunately I have a habit of uh, you know, not wanting right. to leave any stone unturned and trying to speak to uh, you know, a million people and look at a million different angles. But uh, the, the short answer is yes, there will be something coming in the future. So Fantastic. Well, uh, Guy, I appreciate your time. I know you're a busy person. I mean, during this uh, stay-at-home order in 95% of the country, 95% uh, of the world, I should say, um, you know, I know we've got nothing but time on our hands, but with the beauty of uh, technology, we're able to connect via phone, computers, you know, Skype, uh, what have you. Um, and I want to uh, respect your time constraints and everything. So I want to thank you for coming on. It's been a great conversation. Um, I will be looking forward to that book announcement in the near future. Um, and where could, besides uh, WCW Nitro book, where could people find you on social media? Yeah, thanks, Vinny. And again, I, I do appreciate the invite. And anytime you want to have me back on, just please give me a shout. You know how to get in touch with me. Um, people can uh, follow the, the Twitter account, WCW Nitro Book. Um, in terms of where you can get the book, there's really two different places. It, there's WCWNitroBook.com and also Amazon. So regardless of what country you happen to be in listening to this, if you just put in WCW Nitro book. The full title is Nitro, The Incredible Rise and Inevitable Collapse of Ted Turner's WCW. But if you put in WCW Nitro book uh, on any of the Amazon sites, it'll pop up there. You know, you could read the reviews for yourself. You can look at some of the comments from, from other readers. And uh, we also have an audio book, uh, which just came out, which right now is only available on WCWNitroBook.com. Uh, but will shortly be on Audible. So we're just waiting for um, Audible to uh, to finalize that for us. Um, but that should be coming in the next week or two as well. So um, again, Vinny, thanks a lot for the invite and uh, any time you want to do Okay, guy, there. thank you very much for your time. Uh, enjoy the rest of the stay at home, stay safe, and keep your hands washed. <laughs> so You're you welcome. Well. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, Vinny. Bye-bye. And there you have it, my interview with Guy Evans, the author of Nitro, The Incredible Rise and Inevitable Collapse of Ted Turner's WCW. Uh, highly recommended, I highly recommend the book. I highly recommend the podcast with Neil Pruitt, Secrets of WCW Nitro. And uh, we have a lot of time on our hands. So if you're looking for something to do to pass the time and want to learn something about WCW, if you haven't already read it, I, I highly recommend going to WCWNitroBook.com or on Amazon. Order the book, you know, it'll, because it's not an essential item. It may take a little while to get to you, but honestly, I recommend you going out and buying it. I uh, I enjoyed it. I thoroughly enjoyed it, you know, and uh, look forward to another book announcement coming out in about six months on uh, Guy's Twitter, at WCWNitroBook. Um but I want to say thank you to Guy Evans because, uh, you know, he uh, took his time out for, for a relatively unknown person. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I can't thank him enough for agreeing to, you know, come on the sports wire today. But anyways, that's about it. Uh, I will be back in a couple days, probably with another update for uh, for the people out there because, you know, we got nothing but time on our hands. I want to go over the unfortunate uh, collapse of the XFL. Um, I wonder if maybe we'll get a book out of a book soon about the XFL both times from someone, maybe guy himself. Uh, but I do want to say that uh, this has been a fantastic show and I'll be back with another episode uh, in a couple days uh, right here on the sports wire. Remember to uh, follow me on Twitter at the Apicella SWE. You can follow the Sportswire on Twitter and Instagram at Sportswire Audio. You can email me, sportswireaudio at gmail.com, for any questions you may have uh, or just to get in touch with me for possible interviews or if you want to come on the show while we're, during the, while we're on this stay-at-home uh, order, 
uh, during this COVID-19 crisis. And uh, you can also go to sportswireaudio.com. That brings us to brings you to our anchor.fm page. And there you can listen to every episode that's available of the Sportswire. My name is Vinny Apicella. Thank you so much for listening. And I'll be back next time, next Sportswire time. And next, sport, well, same Sportswire channel. <laughs> Have a great day, everybody.